Good morning, and the Lord be with you. It is uh, good to be gathered here on this Lord's Day, and the sun coming after all the storms of the weekend. Um, If uh, I I told a couple other people, if it's a little bit chilly in here, that's my fault. I turned the heat off on Tuesday when it was so hot, (laughs) thinking I will turn it back on on Friday when I'm here, and then I got sick and wasn't here on Friday. But anyway, I'm feeling better now, although I don't sound all the way back and it tested negative for COVID and all that. It's just a regular everyday cold. But uh, um, so I'm thankful to be feeling better and all that. But I didn't get the heat back on until this morning. So but it is coming up. So hopefully it's it's comfortable for everybody. But uh, um, are there any other announcements outside of the ones that we have up here? We've got Bible study coming on. Uh, we have a deacons meeting right after the service today. Um, anything else for the good of everyone? Yeah. Um, Mike turns 38 on Thursday. Ah, Mike turns 38 on Thursday. Happy early birthday. That's wonderful. Should we, uh, do it? Enjoy it. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> Wonderful. Any other announcements this morning? Very good. Well, let's uh, move from getting here to being here. Let's open our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 116. What shall we return to the Lord for all the good, the things that God has done for us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Our opening hymn is number 147, How Great Thou Art. Let's stand as we're able and sing.
friends, the proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare approach God with confidence. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Please join with me. Merciful God, we humbly confess our sins and ask your mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not done justice, loved kindness, or walked humbly with you, our God. Have mercy on us, O God, in your loving kindness, in your great compassion, cleanse us from our sin, create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Please be seated. Thank you. 
I invite the children to come forward. Hey guys, how are you? Very good. So, this morning, at the very beginning of the text, we're going to read again from uh, 1 John, and we're going to read from chapter 3. At the very beginning, of that passage. This is what John writes. It says, see what love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Now, I think that's a really important thing for us to remember. Really important. I and mean, there's two things I want to point out. The first one is that we are children of God, right? That we call, when we talk to God, just like when Jesus was here, he called God his dad. He called him his father, Abba. It, he uses that word too, Abba Father. That um, God is our uh, heavenly parent, right? And that we can go just like you go to your parents with stuff, right? And you can tell them things and you can have confidence that they're going to care for you and all those things. That we can go to our heavenly parent as well, God, and tell God things and, and not be afraid of God. Um, and all those kinds of things, right? So that's the number one thing, that God is our Heavenly Father and that we can trust Him. And then the second thing is this, is that God makes us that by lavishing His love on us. It's not because of anything we did, right? We didn't do anything, just like you didn't do anything to be uh, the children of your parents, right? Um, you, didn't have, you didn't get a choice in that matter, you know? And so... God lavishes God's love on us and calls us children. He makes us his children because he created us and he loves us. And that's what makes us children of God, not because we earned it or done anything to deserve it, but just because God loves us. And I love that word lavish. Do you guys know what the word lavish means? It means like putting a bunch of stuff, like not just... Not just like a little bit of something, but a lot and a lot. That's like lavishing something on. And so it's a wonderful word that he uses here that, that the Father, God, loves us so much that he lavishes that love on us so that we can be called children of God. And so I want you to remember that always. Not only are you children of your parents and all of that, and that's wonderful, but that you are also all children of God. Why? Because God loves us and lavishes that love on us. And makes us God's children. That's who we are. So I want you to remember that always, and because it's really, really important part of what the Bible teaches us about God's love. So let's pray, and then you can head out. Um, dear God, thank you that you lavish your love on us, and that you love us so much that you, you made us our ch your children in Jesus. That we can come to you, and that we can trust you, and we know that you are there for us, Lord, even in hard times. Um, so help us to remember that. And to help us to be uh, confident in that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, I ask if there are any uh, prayer requests or updates or any of those uh, kinds of things. Yeah. My cousin Steve made it through his liver transplant fantastically. He's now home through mushrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Good news. So Steve's liver transplant went well at home now. Doing well. That's great news. Thank you. Any other updates? Uh, I would just say thank you for the change in weather, the sunshine, and the, the flooding down the way. Yeah. Yay. Thanks for the sunshine and uh, at least a, a, a period of no rain. <laughs> yep. Floods receding slowly but surely. Uh, Mike, did you have some? 
Oh, yeah, a couple prepared. Um, one is for Will Rapton. He's like a skin player that I know. His uh, father was murdered. Oh, my goodness. Family. Bosch family. Uh, my foreman jokingly asked me to pray that we would get this job by his house. I don't know. He thought I seriously would. <laughs> All right. Yeah, what was his name? Uh, Mike. Mike. Job by his house. <laughs> um, and Will, what was his? Rabbit. R rabbit. R A B A T I R A B A T I. That's it. O N. Okay. So, well. Anything else? Yeah, Jess. Uh, praises for Rick's birthday this week, and also traveling to Indiana. So, yep, praises for Mike's birthday and travel mercies for trip to Indiana. Anything else? All right, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day that you have made, and we are uh, indeed here to rejoice and be glad in it. We're also here because we know that you have uh, called us not only to gather in your name, but to bring our prayer requests as well as our praises to you. And so with confidence, we lift these up knowing that you care for us and that indeed we are your children and you have lavished your love upon us and you want to hear from us. So we lift these up to you in uh, trust and knowing that you will respond. Lord, we pray uh, and give thanks that Cousin Steve's liver transplant went so well and that he is at home and doing well. We pray for that continued recovery and for the kidney just to work well. And uh, we thank you for this second chance that's been given to him. And we pray that you would just bless him and heal his body. Lord, we give thanks for the sunshine and for the um, a period of no rain after so much all at once, uh, Lord, that caused flooding. We do pray for all those who uh, were impacted by the flooding and ask that um, you would be with them. But uh, we do give you thanks for this uh, reprieve and uh, just a little bit of time to dry out after all of this. And so we pray and give thanks for the beautiful sunshine this morning. Lord, we pray for Will, uh, whose father was uh, murdered. Lord, we pray that you would be with him in this time of sadness and ask that you would bless him and give him peace and be with his family in this time of mourning and loss. Lord, we uh, ask that you would uh, just bring the peace that passes all understanding and the hope that indeed you have overcome the grave. Be with that family, Lord, we pray. We also pray for the Posh family who um, lost a loved one who took his own life. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be with them. Heal them in body, mind, and soul. Give them peace in the midst of this tragedy. Lord, be with all those who suffer from severe depression and any kind of thoughts of suicide. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and strengthen them, that they might know your love and your grace and your peace in the midst of their life. Be with the Posh family, we pray. Lord, we pray for Mike and uh, this possible job near his house. We pray that the company might be able to get it and that that would be a good thing uh, for him and for all those who are working on that job. We pray that you would uh, uh, bless them through this and all those who are working alongside him. We do give thanks for Mike's birthday coming up on Thursday. We pray your blessing upon him in the coming year, as well as give thanks for all of the years uh, and his love for his family and your church and pray that you would just bless him this week and be with the Ken Bucks as they travel to Indiana on this weekend and ask your blessing upon them and the trip and that it would be a good time for all and that uh, you would be with them as they travel. 
Lord, we continue to lift up to the ongoing strife around our world. We pray for where there is war to be peace, where there is hunger, that people would be fed, where there is thirst, that people would receive drinks of water. And Lord, that your church would continue to be your hands and feet, serving those in need around us. Be with us, we pray, and hear us as we join our voices together, saying the words that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our middle hymn is number 368, He Lives. Let us pray and dedicate our tithes and offerings to God. Gracious God, we know that all we have is a gift from you. And so out of that abundance that you have lavished upon us, we return to you. These are tithes, our offerings. Indeed, we offer our whole selves, our time and our talent as well. We ask that you would sanctify them, that they would be set aside for your holy purpose and work in this world. That indeed it is your will that is done, your kingdom that comes on earth as it is in heaven. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.
please be seated. Our scripture passage this morning comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to actually read 1 to 10, though uh, I extended it and forgot to pass that along to Crystal, but the whole section goes to 10, so I'm going to read it three extra verses there, um, which can be found on page 1184 in the Pew Bible, uh, if you'd like to turn and follow along. But before I read that, let me pray and ask for God's understanding and guidance as we uh, read this together. Holy and gracious God, uh, we give thanks that we are gathered here uh, and have the opportunity by your spirit to grow in faith and faithfulness to you. We ask that by your spirit, you would inspire us to understand these words that were inspired many years ago. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, for indeed you are our rock and our redeemer. Through Christ we pray. Amen. So John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 10 says this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But what we know, but but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purifies themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, the sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who, is do who does what is sinful is the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know the children of God and are and who, I'm sorry, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, here's the thing, friends. We don't like contradictions, right? We don't like them. At least we don't like them out there in the world, right? We live with contradictions in our own life, and we don't necessarily pay a lot of attention to those. Um, but when we look at the, li the life of the world around us, right, and in other people's lives, we prefer to see things in black and white, right? That's just like, so yes, we can understand shades of gray in our own life, and we can live with our own contradictions that we all have. Um, but, and we have kind of a more nuanced understanding of our own internal dilemmas and all those things. But when we see the world outside of us, we tend to want to think in black and white terms. For instance, right? Uh, and I've been using a lot of traffic illustrations recently. I don't know. It's because I'm driving a lot more now, but or what? But uh, if if we see a person in traffic cut us off, right? Or cut somebody else off, right? They're just being a jerk. But when we cut somebody off, it was an accident or simply necessary thing that we must have done in order, you know, given the situation we were in. Right. So we're willing to give ourselves a little grace but, or, uh, you know, and live with that contradiction, um, whereas we might not in other people's lives. Now, our passage this morning presents us with an uneasy contradiction uh, within the text of First John. It's just reality that it is there. Um, and so it. And what it says this week, what we read in chapter three versus what we read in the uh, chapter one and beginning of chapter two last week seem to be in conflict with one another. Um, but the reality is that uh, while they are in tension with one another, they're, they're both there. And so what do we do with that, that tension, that conflict in the text itself? So let's take a look at it this morning and see what we can do uh, in terms of our understanding. Now, here's the thing. Everything in this text that I just read is pretty straightforward, 
right? Um, you can get it. It's not like the words are difficult. Um, and yet within it, it's like, wait a minute. It's, it, you, you feel like you almost get whiplash when you're reading it, uh, you know, because at first it starts off with this wonderful verse reminding us that we are children of God, right? And that just by the grace of God, not because of anything we've done, we have just been made, the, we are made um, children of God, right? That we should be called children of God by God. And that's what we are, he exclaims. Why? Because the Father has just simply lavished God's love upon us. And that's it, right? And so that's where it begins in this section. And it harkens back to that reality, right? That it said when we read last week that God forgives us, right? And declares us righteous when we confess and that we've got Jesus interceding for us and all these kinds of things. Uh, that this becomes our identity of who it is we are in Jesus, that we are a child of God. Now, the world doesn't always recognize us as children of God, he goes on to say. Um, why? Because they didn't recognize who Jesus was. They didn't recognize God and what God was doing in the midst of Jesus. And so because they kind of miss that revelation or until they come to an understanding of it, they don't fully understand that who we are as children of God and what God has done for us. Because of this, um, we will be made like Jesus and are to purify ourselves as he is pure. So, right, so we're the, you can kind of follow the logic. We're children of God. And so because of that and because we're in Jesus, right, we are to purify ourselves because Jesus is pure. That is, he's without sin. This means that the, the children of God should not go on sinning. Why? Because Jesus came to take away our sins. And in him, there is no sin. John says. So if we are in him, that is in Jesus, we shouldn't sin. Instead, we should do what is right. That is what is the righteous thing, just as he is righteous. And so we get this, you can see kind of like the swing here. All of a sudden, we wait, we really like, the, it's like, oh man, God's grace is lavished on us and we're children of God. Now all of a sudden he's saying, wait a minute, wait, we shouldn't sin, you know? Uh, well, okay, that's really hard. Um, and I'm not sure about that, but that's what he goes on to say. We should do what's right. This brings us to the contrast right at the very end um, between the children of light and the children of the darkness. Right. So those who do what is right equal the children of God and they're the ones living in the light. Those who sin are doing what's wrong equal the children of the devil. So, um, and in this whole thing, we need to remember that John, and if you read the rest of chapter two, and also as we get into the later chapters of, of John, you'll see that doing what is right means loving people, especially loving your brother. In fact, just before this in John chapter two, he's talking about how you can't say you love God and then hate your brother or sister, right? The people around you. In other words, he flat out says, you can't say that you are love God and then don't like the people around you. <laughs> like that's basically what he's saying, right? That's not, you can't, can't do that. And so we know that doing what is right equals doing what is loving towards others. So what do we do with this seeming contradiction between this wonderful news of God's grace and the lavish love of God on us? And yet at the same time, this call that says, no, nope, now that you're children of God, you can't keep on sinning, right? Don't, you know, uh, you know that you need to be purified yourselves. It, it, it sounds like those two things are in conflict. And it just said earlier, by the way, you know, in chapter, uh, beginning of chapter two, end of chapter one, that when we do sin, we have an advocate for ourselves. And so if he says to the Christians that he's writing to, but when we do sin, we have an advocate with the father who purifies us from all unrighteousness, then why does he say here that we should not go continue to sin and we can't? And if we are uh, sinning, then we're, you know, children of the devil. What on earth do we do with this kind of whiplash contradiction here? So, um, which is it? If we say we're without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is, uh, will forgive us all unrighteousness and uh, that we have an advocate with the Father even when we do sin. Or is it that we should not continue to sin um, because we're in Christ and we're the children of God? 
and that we shouldn't be sinning at all because Christ in Christ there is no sin. Um, which one is it? Are we children of God or children of the devil, right? What on earth is going on here? How do we reconcile these two realities within the text? Now, the first thing is I think we need to understand what not to do, right, with these. Because there's a tendency, just like I said at the beginning, there's a tendency to, to be perfectly capable of living with contradiction and nuance in our understanding of ourselves, but not in our view of, out, of people out there in the world, right? The temptation is to apply... 1 John 1 and 2 and the, the words of grace and the children of God and the lavish love to ourselves while applying the kind of harder verses to everybody else, right? About the children of the devil and the darkness and all that. We are the children of God who get forgiveness, but people we don't like or the ones who uh, we believe commit the kinds of sins that are really the bad ones, Right kinds of sins we commit really aren't the bad ones, but those people out there, right? They're the ones that are doing the really bad ones and they are unrepentant because they keep on sinning. They keep on doing them. Um, that they're really the ones that this is talking about, right? They're the children of the devil and they get what they're going to get what's coming to them. That tends to be what we do, right? But this would be a great mistake. Remember that this, this entire letter here that, John is writing, is being written to the church, right? And for the church. In other words, he's writing this to insiders, not to outsiders. Not to make us feel like good about or better about ourselves over and against the outsiders, no. So what do we do then? What do we do? Well, I think it's really important for us to recognize that there's a tension in scripture and that both things are true at the same time. That we indeed can be a child of God, but at the same time be a child of the devil, right? When we are messing up and doing things wrong. I'm remembered, uh, I, you know, I'm reminded when I think of that idea, I, I think I can't help but think of uh, the story in the Gospels of Peter, right? And Jesus asking, well, who... Who do the people out there say that I am? And some say, they're like, well, some say you're John the Baptist, you know, come back to life. Some people say you're a prophet. Some, and then he asks, who do you say that I am? And, and Peter says, well, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. And it's like, he gets it right, right? He's the you know wonderful child of God. He, he's got it. He's doing the right thing. He's saying the right thing. And then literally Jesus starts talking about how he must suffer and die and be turned over and all this. And Peter's like, absolutely not. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, right? Like just in the same, literally within, you know, three or four verses of each other, all of that takes place, right? In the gospels. Martin Luther, um, not King, but Martin Luther, you know, the one back in the Reformation period of time who nailed the, the theses to the Wittenberg door, um, he had, uh, had a famous saying, uh, saying that we were all, all Christians are saints and sinners, right? At the same time, at the same time, that's our reality. And that, yes, it's a contradiction, but it's the reality of who we are. That we can in one minute be doing what is good and right and living into that reality that we are children of God and that's who we are. And then in another minute we can, turn our backs on God and be doing something that we know we shouldn't, right? This is the Christian life. It's a bit of a contradiction or a tension that always needs to be held together. On the one side, we know we are saved and made children of God because purely by God's grace and love that has been lavished upon us, that God forgives even our worst sins and has dealt with them because of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. This is absolutely true, and we can never forget it. But on the other hand, we are called out to live our lives in accordance with that reality, right? As children of God, in holiness, being pure as he is pure. That is, we are to hold ourselves to Jesus's higher ethical standard and to do what is righteous, that is, to do what is loving and follow Jesus' commands. It's always this balance in the Christian life that, yeah, you are grace and you come to God just as you are and that you are forgiven and you are loved. But at the same time, then God doesn't want us to stay there. 
our, our stay in our sin, but instead wants us to grow in the faith and faithfulness and to grow and, you know, slowly over time, you know, putting off our sinful ways and growing into doing what is the more loving and righteous thing to do. The danger is when a person or a church or a group overemphasize one side of this tension over the other. Maybe admit that it's not a balance that we have to hold. An overemphasis on holiness without remembering grace leads to a legalistic and unforgiving and cold church that is just angry at everybody and condemning the world, right? But an overemphasis on grace and forgiveness, um, that side, right? If we just emphasize that side and we forget the other side, well, then we end up with a church that fails to call people to do what is right and just and live in a way that God wants us to and leads to kind of an anything goes Christianity. Neither of these are the complete gospel picture that Jesus gives us of his kingdom. So how do we hold this tension together? I think the first thing is we need to realize that we need to hold both these truths always together and understand that we might need to be reminded of them at different times. What do I mean by that? Well, when we're feeling beaten down and overcome by guilt because we know we've messed up and we've done something wrong, we need to remember that Jesus is advocating for us, right? That God loves us and forgives us of all unrighteousness. We need to remember that truth because it is 100% true. But on the other hand, when we are feeling full of ourselves and thinking that we are just fine the way we are, right? And that all those other people out there are the ones that are doing wrong. And they just listen to us or do it the, do the thing the way that we say that it is, that they're the ones doing the bad stuff. We need to remember that Jesus calls us to do what is righteous and to be pure, what is loving in all areas of our life and not to become complacent in our faith and think that we get it all right. There's always room to grow in faith and faithfulness to Jesus and his teachings. So friends, might God grant us the grace and perseverance to live out our lives as children of God, because that is indeed who we are. But also trusting that as we grow in faith and faithfulness to him, that one day we will be fully made to be like him. While right now we might not be there yet. Amen. And amen. Let us now stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed that are found printed on the back of your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our final hymn today is 597, Take My Life and Let It Be.
So friends, as we go out of the world, I will remember that we are both saints, that is children of God, based on the grace of God that he has lavished upon us and he has made us that. And that is indeed who we are and we can be firm in that. But at the same time, we are called to live into that reality and to love our neighbor and our brothers and sisters as ourselves. We often fall short of that, but we're still called to seek to live that way. It's that tension, right? That we're saved by grace and there's nothing we can do, but, after, but, but on top of that, God then calls us to live into that reality um, that we might grow in faith and faithfulness to Christ. May we never forget both sides of that tension, um, that they are equally true. So may we go knowing the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the steadfast love of God the Father that calls us children of God and makes us that lavishes his love upon us. And may we be brought together by the communion of the Holy Spirit that sends us out to love the world and to grow in faith and faithfulness to him. One God, now and forever. Friends, may we go in peace. Amen.